I've been looking forward to talking to our next guest because I think he could be a rising star in American politics. I certainly hope so. Kanyela Ng is in the Hawaii State House of Representatives. He's been there since November of 2012. Before that, he was an activist, and we may talk a little bit about his activism work as well. And he is also a candidate for Hawaii's first district uh, to become a member of the U.S. House of Representatives for the state of Hawaii. And I like what I've heard so far about what he has to say. Uh, so first of all, Kanyelo Ng, thanks. Kanyela Ng, thanks so much for joining us. No, aloha and thank you for having me. Oh, listen, it's a pleasure. And first of all, I want to get to your ideas, which I find very interesting. Uh, and I don't want to embarrass you or pry, but I do want to tell you that, you know, I went in, um, I, I just looked on my phone on the way over here. I just Googled you uh, uh, to see if there were any new developments or whatever. And you know how Google uh, offers suggestions when you type something in? So I typed in Kanyela Ng, and the two suggestions it offered me were, does Kanyela Ng have a wife? and uh, Kanyela and girlfriend. So apparently there are, you have some fans out there for more than just your public policy positions. I don't know if you know that or not, but uh, I hope that- I think they know. might be fans. I think they might be fans of Kara because she's a really strong uh, advocate for women and feminist issues and immigrant issues in her own right. She's a community lawyer. Well, that is a great answer. Um, and, um, so you you come to the campaign for whatever reason, you'll stay for the democratic socialism. Um, so let's talk about your policies a little bit. You do describe yourself as a democratic socialist. Is that correct? That's correct. I believe that there's something better out there than the current system of uh, American capitalism that I think was it 82% of all new wealth last year in 2017 went to the top 1%. In Hawaii, 40% of us aren't making a living wage. 31% of us are living, um, aren't meeting our basic needs for our salaries and relying on social programs. And 80% of us now are living paycheck to paycheck, just one medical emergency away or car crash from going under. So um, the system is broken. And we're quickly, if you, if you looked at that um, Zuckerberg hearing uh, yesterday, uh, we're moving very quickly to oligarchy if we're not already there. Um, you know, the Senate was pitching the softest questions to this billionaire, knowing that he could bankroll, um, you know, their campaigns or their opponents' campaigns. And that's exactly what an oligarchy looks like. So the system is broken, uh, both on the <clears throat> economic side and the governmental side. And um, democratic socialism uh, gives me hope that... Um, and especially the movement that's that's building towards it, that there's something there's that there's something a lot better out there for America. You know, I, I, a couple of things. One, first of all, I want to let our let remi her. remind our audience that we are pre-taping a little earlier this week. So, uh, yes, Mark uh, Zuckerberg was testifying yesterday. To uh, you know, I uh, went to work in uh, Jan um, March of 2015 for a Democratic Socialist named. Bernie Sanders, and they told us he, he didn't have a shot at doing well at all. He's now the most popular active politician in the nation, as I recall correctly. So we've moved past the days when that label uh, marginalizes any of our political leaders. And secondly, you know, speaking of Mark Zuckerberg, uh, I think, you're, first of all, you're absolutely right. I, I was quite disappointed, actually, in the questions, and then a Democratic senator went on MSNBC that night and said, oh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg assured us that he would do better, and Mark, you know, I, I don't believe in a system where billion, we have to rely on the kindness of billionaires or the assurance of billionaires that they won't do us more harm than they've done already, and I, I don't think you do either, but you and Mark Zuckerberg have a little bit of a history, right? Oh yeah, back in uh, two years ago, um, Mark went and bought 700 acres on Kauai, uh, beachfront property, really beautiful. Um, and some of that, 17 acres of that land was owned by um, native Hawaiians. They had kuleana gathering rights to this plot of land. And um, 
rather than sitting down and negotiating with them, he sued them. Uh, and that was the first correspondence they got. So, you know, they had to lawyer up their, themselves. Uh, and any legal, even if they were awarded some kind of settlement, it, it probably would have been less than the legal costs incurred. So he sued them under using the same mechanisms that like the sugar barons did back in the like 100 years ago in Hawaii to displace native Hawaiians off their land. So a lot of people were upset. I got on the media. I called them a modern day colonizer. Um, and after about two weeks of bad press going back and forth, uh, he dropped the lawsuits. So it was uh, we did win that battle. But, you know, these these families are still without their land, so there's still kind of this ongoing uh, struggle, but they are, are no longer facing the lawsuits. So, um, yeah, I think when it comes to facing off with the billionaire, it's better to go the PR route than uh, trying to get into a legal battle with him uh, or a political battle. So that's that's kind of the tack we took, and um, that's something that I think Congress should be doing right now. Unfortunately, most of the members of Congress uh, aren't too familiar with social media. It's, it doesn't come naturally to them. And uh, I, I don't, it didn't seem like they had a real grasp on the problems that we're facing right now with an unregulated oligarch controlling our means of communication in America. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I think that, you know, we do have modern day colonizers of real space and digital space as well. And one, but just so you know, one of the themes we keep returning to on this program is the latter, because I think it is a really important issue, and I'm glad you understand that and understand how to how to resist it as well. So well, let's talk a little bit about Hawaii, because that would be your constituency, of course. I, I I've been there a number of times to um, several of the islands, and have a you know very great affection for it. I have dear friends who work at Maui Community College and elsewhere. Um, and I've been on the main island as well, but uh, I, um, it strikes me that uh, from what m my brief exposure to, exposures to it, that you have this combination of uh, high real estate values, low wage occupations, and difficulty getting steady work that is almost kind of a, an amplified version of what the rest of the country is facing in terms of the growing wealth gap and the difficulty of sustaining anything like a middle class life if you're not a part of the privileged few. Is that is that an accurate impression? Yeah, if you look outside right now at Kaka'ako, there's these luxury condominiums popping up every couple of weeks. Single condos breaking records now going for um, anywhere from three to twenty million dollars, uh, right next to Native Hawaiians and veterans living on the streets. So the, you know the, <clears throat> the visible poverty is stark, and the inequality it's it's unprecedented here. It's getting worse and worse. Um, I think, I mean, like I said earlier, forty percent of us aren't living, um, aren't making living wage, um, and the median house in my district is now um, seven hundred seventy thousand dollars. Uh, and, you know, in order to afford that, you need to be making at least $190,000. And that's not happening. I mean, in order to be in the middle class right now in Hawaii, you need to be making over $200,000. So the vast majority of us aren't even in the middle class. And, you know, when that happens, that hurts businesses as well. Because one thing businesses need to survive is customers. And if nobody's eating out or, or dining at restaurants, um, or you know, shopping for clothes, the whole economy will eventually collapse. So it's really important that we uh, shift um, power to the middle class from the few to the many, but also um, stop this uh, runaway inequality and wealth distribution that's happening, um, where you know the bottom half of us is everything we make, everything we produce is going to the top 0.1 percent now. So let's talk, uh, and, and I couldn't agree with you more, and let's talk, let's pivot for a second at least, uh, away from economics and toward social issues. You did, you, you've done something that I think is quite uh, unusual given the position you're in, which is you've spoken out against uh, uh, a democratic icon in your state, or at least uh, about against uh, naming the airport. After that icon, Senator Daniel Inouye was uh, represented Hawaii for many years, a leading uh, politician there. But there have been accusations of uh, 
some form of some form of sexual misconduct, and you have suggested that perhaps it's not appropriate to have an airport named after him, given those allegations. That can't have been uh, the best political move for you. So uh, why did you do it? Um, you know, some sometimes things are politically. Um, important and sometimes they're personally important or just actually important. Um, naming the airport after Daniel K. Inouye was a big mistake. There are 10 women now who have accused him of everything from sexual harassment to rape. Um, and, you know, they, a lot of them didn't feel comfortable to come out while he was alive because um, the power structure is set up in a way that silences them. Uh, Back in 1992, when the first allegation of um, sexual assault came out, none of the women, although a bunch of women in the legislative caucus believed, told reporters they believed the victim, um, very, f no one was willing to say it publicly except for one uh, representative, Anel Amaral. And as soon as she did so, the Inoy machine uh, lined up an opponent against her and actually ended her entire career. And she was the majority leader, the second highest position in the in the state house at the time. Uh, so, you know, that was really chilling for for any other leader in power. And not only did um, so, like the women uh, were afraid to speak up. But what it really took at the time was a, a man in power to be like, hey, like to create a safe space because until women have like the critical mass in the legislature, um, it, you know, it, it feels like a fool's errand to speak up. But because the old boys club was so protective of their own rather than the people they're supposed to be representing. Um, no one spoke up at all. I think I was, since I was born, I haven't heard a single man in power hold another man in power accountable. And that's really the missing piece to this puzzle when it comes to Me Too and Time's Up. A lot of brave women are standing up and unleashing their voices. And, but until men are willing to say, hey, I believe you, and hold each other accountable, it's gonna take a long time to, to reach critical mass. So I, I wanted to kind of start that here in Hawaii and, and open up that space. And sure enough, um, more and more um, victims are coming out now. Um, there was one just last week, uh, another survivor of, of that Daniel K. Inouye. Uh, so I think the, air, the airlines are already stopped have already stopped saying uh, welcome to Daniel K. Inouye Airport. Oh, really? Uh -huh. Take a big push to um, actually remove his name from it. But, you know, right now, just as a symbol, this isn't a swipe at the center. It's just as a symbol, whether or not we believe the allegations of these survivors, um, by naming the airport after um, Inouye, we're telling them and victims everywhere that we do not believe you. And that's exactly the opposite of what this Me Too movement's about. And it's um, embarrassing for Hawaii because this is the most visible visible visited building in the state. Right. It's where most people come in. And um, yeah, and it's, we're also even worse. We're telling women uh, either that we don't believe you or we don't we don't uh, value what you went through enough to respect it. And I think that's that's an even more devastating message. So let's talk in the couple minutes we have left, uh, Kanyela, and let's talk about the, your primary. You're running in the Democratic primary. You have several opponents, right? Yes, I'm running against uh, a few Democrats, but I'm the only opponent. I'm, o I'm the only candidate in this race who does not accept the dollar from corporations or their lobbyists. Uh, I think that's the future of politics, especially in the Democratic Party. Uh, you know, money is the root of all of our problems right now, I believe very strongly. And getting money out of politics is the one reform that will make all other reforms possible. So, you know, when it comes, I, I stand really strong on Medicare for all, um, uh, tuition free college, uh, really aggressive climate action, a 100 percent renewable future, because uh, I can speak with the level of truth that other candidates can who are who aren't unmoored from corporate donors. Um, so I don't have to listen to Big Pharma or you know the military industrial complex or um, corporate polluters, and I can just speak my mind. And that's been really um, gaining a lot of traction on the ground here. We have 200 volunteers signed up on the ground and uh, ready to knock on doors and 4,000 individual donors. That's a record for this district. And you know we rely on small donations, so every bit goes a long way. And it's a lot of working folks who are, you know, working as cashiers or um, all sorts of jobs. And it's really, it's not the typical donor who buys a thousand dollar plate at a fundraiser. So it's really encouraging to see what we're building up. And uh, if the working 
people come out, uh, we will win. And you also, uh, from from what I've read, uh, believe in the intersection of electoral politics and movement politics, which is something we strongly support here as well. And you will have at least one or two uh, um, fellow representatives, if, if, if you're elected to Congress, who feel the same way. So speaking of uh, donations from people and not corporations or oligarchs, uh, where can people go to learn more about your campaign and maybe give you $27 or some multiple thereof? Uh, uh We were the only candidate in this race who actually has a thorough platform page based on everything that Congress, the big issues that we're facing today. So there's a 30-point platform, very clear where I stand. I don't have to wait to polls to come out. I'm running on my convictions. I'm not... I'm not trying to play both sides of the issue and put out an issue page later on. Uh, it's either you know you support the agenda or you don't, and uh, it's a really bold economic agenda that includes a job guarantee. I'm exploring a universal basic income, um, you know, enshrining the rights to strike and bargain and organize into law, uh, and just just probably the most one of the most progressive platforms across the nation. And it's all backed by my record in the state house. I've been pushing these things at the state level, and now we're taking it to Congress. So, yeah, every bit goes a long way. We don't rely on consultants or pollsters. Uh, you know, I, we go directly to the people um, and knocking on doors and listening. So, uh, yeah, that's the easiest way to chip in. Every bit, whether it's a dollar or two dollars or whatever you can afford, really goes a long way. Well, uh, we wish you the very best of luck. Uh, I wish you the best of luck. You certainly have my support. Uh, I thank you for running. And Kanyela Ng, uh, thank you uh, for coming on the program. Thanks for having me, RJ. Aloha.